Well, good evening. It's really good to uh, see our house filling up. And like some students in school, they like to sit in the back rows. And uh, welcome, whether you're in the front or the back. Uh, if you want to come closer, you're certainly welcome to do that. There will be opportunity later this evening for some question and answer, and we'll be able to walk a mic around, so even, it uh, doesn't matter where you're seated, uh, feel free to be thinking about what would be questions I might want to ask at the end of the evening. My name is Paul Lehman, and I'm the head of school here, and we're really glad to have this community event, and I have a number of thank yous uh, to to express because without these individuals and uh, local organizations, this wouldn't have been possible. I'd like to begin by thanking Chris Riddle, who's standing there in the back. Chris is an area pastor and parent, and uh, he has had a passion for the topic about technology for quite some time, has done a lot of research and a lot of reading. He happened upon this book and uh, had the opportunity to make connections with uh, Joe and Matt and facilitated making connections and rallying support and, and certainly the school's interest in hosting tonight's uh, event. So I'd like to uh, shout out to uh, Chris Riddle a big thank you. Two of our partners for this event uh, that Chris was um, instrumental in bringing along are James Madison University and WVPT Public Media. And I encourage you to stop by their booth out there and pick up a badge. Both Joe and Matt are graduates of JMU, so that's a really neat connection that JMU and their education department uh, has had uh, in helping to sponsor this event. Additionally, a large shout out to Parkview Federal Credit Union, Everence, and Eastern Mennonite University, and I know there's some representatives from the university up the hill here as well. And so thank you for your sponsorships. In addition to support from Shirley's Popcorn and Brian May's Karate Studio. So let's give all of them a, a big hand for supporting this event. In case you need a restroom, uh, you can get to those by going out the exits and just heading kind of to that back corner area of the auditorium out in the hallway. You'll find uh, women's and men's restrooms conveniently located. And also want to simply announce that uh, Matt and Joe naturally have a book that they have written and we've asked them to bring copies. If you're interested in a copy, they'll be available in the foyer afterwards for $20, and then you don't need to pay shipping, and they guarantee they'd be happy to sign it for you. So uh, if you're interested in reading more in depth about what they say, and I would encourage you to do that, uh, you can pick up a book this evening if you would like. Joe Clement and Matt Miles are both graduates of JMU and authors of the book you see on the screen, Screen Schooled, Two Veteran Teachers Expose How Technology Overuse is Making Our Kids Dumber. These two have done extensive research and drawn on their own experience to argue that educators have rushed in the past decade to digitalize instruction without really taking the time to ask, what is best really for our students and for our children? This afternoon, they uh, gave an assembly to our students, and I would say our, in, our students were glued and engaged to what they were saying. Uh, there was a lot of great conversation among students, and I had some with students as they left. After that, they gave a professional development uh, interaction time with our faculty. And this evening, they have committed their evening to helping to open our eyes and um, help our minds become more aware of the impact our devices and screens are making on young people, but not just young people, really all of us. And so I, uh, I hope you find this evening to be uh, intriguing, engaging, mind-provoking, thought-provoking, and uh, something that will begin conversations with you, your family, your children, people that you love. Again, take note of questions because at the end there will be opportunity to ask them. 
thank you for coming out and let's give a warm valley welcome to Joe and Matt. Thank you. Great to have you here. Thanks. Great to be here. Hi, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Really appreciate you coming out. Uh, thank you to the school and JMU and everybody uh, that you just heard about that made this possible. This is really a, a great opportunity for us, and we're very happy to meet with you all and uh, talk about what we've discovered. Um, we're especially pressed, impressed that you're here tonight. It makes us feel pretty good because you could have gone to see John Grisham. Um, I understand he's in town, so uh, I don't know if anybody needs to leave. <laughs> I hope not. Um, but yeah, really, thank you for being here and giving up your uh, Wednesday night. This, uh, this means a lot. Um, I have to issue a disclaimer before we start, which is we are tonight in no way speaking on behalf of our employer, um, which you will discover uh, is pretty clear here in the next few, min <laughs> few minutes. Um, my name is Joe Clement, that's Matt Miles, and we wrote a book uh, called Screen School. We're both uh, teachers, public school teachers in Northern Virginia, and we've um, been in the classroom for a while. This is my 25th year. It's not Matt's 25th year, Looks and, <laughs> and we have, uh, we've learned a lot over the, the past uh, decade about this issue, um, screens, and, and not just in school, but in the life of kids. And this all came to be because Matt and I, um, in our department, we eat lunch together every day, and, and, and I don't know, six or eight years ago, we started to, to say the recurring themes at lunch during the discussion. Kids are having trouble solving kind of basic problems, thinking deeply and critically about things, focusing for long periods of time, interacting socially. And we noticed all these deficits that were piling up and piling up. And we started to say, well, what is going on? Why is this happening? And um, I started to read about it. Matt, without me knowing about it, was reading about it. And, and after a while, we would talk at lunch and say, well, you know what I read? Oh, yeah. Well, you know what I read? And everything we read, uh, had some component of there was a there was an overuse of screen time issue that was causing some deficit, and um, we did not come into this with any particular axe to grind. My background before I was in education, I, I spent some time as a Unix system administrator. Um, I have a, a home business uh, that is reliant on it's a data processing business, so I use computers all the time for that. Matt was our um, well, Still your background? am. <laughs> your background. Uh, well, when I entered school, JMU, I came in as an IT major, and then I switched to media arts and design. I wanted to spend my life working on computers before I realized I hate computers. But <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, go ahead. They, and then Matt is uh, interestingly enough, our our every department in our school has a technology representative, and Matt <laughs> Matt is our technology representative. Um, <laughs> And so we don't really, we definitely did not come into this thinking we knew what the answer was or hoping that we were going to be able to say all screens are bad all the time and that's not at all what we're saying. Um, we just were trying to figure out how to help kids. That was it. And everything we read, like I said, they're, they're, whatever the deficit was, it seemed to link back somehow to screen time. And, we said, and, and what we were reading was from neurologists and, and family therapists and psychiatrists and uh, all these people who work with kids but aren't teachers, and so we started to say, well, we've got to read, start reading some stuff about what's happening in school. And uh, we looked around, and there really wasn't a lot. In fact, there was nothing. And so we said, kind of almost jokingly at first, well, we should write a book about it. And, um, and it initially started as, well, maybe we'll write an op-ed or a blog piece or something. And then over time, we realized there was so much out there um, that we felt, you know, we've got enough for a book. And... We're not going to talk tonight about what we think or what we believe so much as what we know to be true. And, and I'm saying we know this to be true because we're seeing it in our classroom, so we have first-hand experience. That's our value added tonight. We're obviously not brain scientists. We're not, uh, you know, f family therapists or psychoanalysts or anything like that. We're teachers. And so we know these things to be true because we've seen them. And then we, because of the miracle of technology, have uh, connected with teachers, not in our, just in our district, but all around the world. And some of those uh, psychiatrists and, and, and brain scientists that we've mentioned, we connected with them. And, and so we're reporting on what they've found, what the what this actual scientists have, have found. So we're talking about things that actually are. And uh, we hope you find this um, illuminating. And we're going to end with some, some steps that you can take uh, to 
to, to strike a better balance, to help our kids. That's really the issue, to help our kids strike a better balance. Yeah, and, and the journey we were on is, is, you know, what we're seeing every single day and what we're reading from neurologists and psychologists, there's such a disparity between that and what we're seeing in the media and what we're hearing about technology. We'd go to in-services that were entirely dedicated to getting more screens in school and how great they are. And, and we're looking at each other going, the answer can't be more screens. It can't be. Um, and, and that's probably why you, you gave up a night where you could be you know, listening to John Grisham or doing anything other than sitting in a school um, to come here is because you know that's, that's, there's something wrong with what we're hearing. Right. This is an ad that uh, came on the news the other last, I was watching the news a couple of weeks ago, and this is the ad that came on. It's just infuriating. So let's see if it works here. Technology, man. <laughs> beverage? Oh, no thanks. Beverage? I'm good. Water or cold beverage? Hi, club soda with lime. Make that to me. I was yelled at my TV, hashtag parenting win. So if you're a good parent, the message obviously. You... What, what is the, you know, the, the ad has to outline the problem. Um, like a good infomercial, you know, the guy trying to unwind the hose, the black and white, his hair is all crazy. Like, what's the problem in this? The problem is parents are interacting with their kids. Their kids are vying for their attention, wanting to interact. And how do you solve that? Well, you get them a leapfrog and you win. Why? Because they're quiet and they're sitting there and they're, they're, leaving you alone. Um, that can't be a win. That can't be right. You know, it, you know it's not right. And the ironic thing is Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, they knew it wasn't right. The people who make the technology wouldn't give it to their own kids. Um, you know, Steve Jobs, when I asked his kids, were asked how much his kids like the iPad, he said, I don't give my kids an iPad, right? What, what did they know? What do we know? But yet what we're being told is completely different. And so the, the first question has to be, well, how, is, this, is this really an issue? And, if, and, they, and the, the subtitle of our book is, is that it's technology overuse. It's not technology use, it's overuse. And, and by definition, overuse is, is disordered. It's, it's, there's a problem, it's overuse. So these are the, the numbers are, are kind of all over the place because there are di different ways to measure what you're counting as screen use. But the, the one that comes up the most often, this is uh, Common Sense Media, um, is that the teenagers are spending around nine hours a day consuming entertainment media. Uh, that doesn't include w what happens in school. That's outside of school. So that's nine hours a day is more than they're doing pretty much anything else, right? More than they're sleeping, more than that's a longer time than you would be in school. Um, it's an enormous amount of time. And so I think most reasonable people would say that's, that would be overuse. I mean, uh, nine hours of anything a day, maybe except sleep, would probably be overuse. Um, so if we put this in perspective, um, yeah, the, the kids got a kick out of this, so we'll go over it again. The average young person will have spent 10,000 hours gaming by the age 21. To put that in perspective, about half that is what's required to get a bachelor's degree. Um, and and we'll, we'll kind of go through this out. What is, what is being lost, right? There's a finite amount of hours in a day, right? And so the, the question that comes up a lot is, well, but digital natives, that's, I don't know if you've heard that phrase before. Kids are digital natives. We're all Im digital immigrants because, you know, they're growing up with technology. So they're, this is part of their world and that's part of who they are. And they're, you know, they're all, it's all kind of one. You know, old people are, you know, old. And so they're not able to understand this. And, and so they're learning in new and different ways that older generations just don't understand, right? That, that kids today learn differently and they're, and they're just in this, this digital world that, we can't possibly understand. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a compelling argument, right? Because we see our own kids like this all day long. I mean, we're talking to a, a sports medicine uh, doctor the other day. And it's, it's actually called, what is it called? Text back? Text neck? Text neck. Text neck. They're actually having some kids spending so much time like this, they've actually <laughs> manipulated their neck in ways it's not supposed to be. Yeah. But, but this is a quote, this is the kind of stuff that we deal with when we're talking about that positive sign, that spin on technology. It's almost religion-like. This is a quote from a, one of the biggest ed tech advocates, Mark Prenskin. He says, the real reason kids play computer and video games is that they're learning 
And it's by playing these games that our kids are unconsciously preparing themselves for their coming life in the 21st century. Uh, video game designer turned educational consultant. Think of how patently absurd that is. You're going to tell me that, that kids lock themselves in their basement or their room for eight hours a day playing games like uh, World of Warcraft where they take on a persona of an orc or an elf and slay goblins so that they can learn about the 21st century. Like, what, what do you think is happening in the 21st century? Like, what? <laughs> and to think that kids are, are playing games because they want to learn, does, have you ever talked to a kid before? <laughs> right? Kids play games because they like playing games. That's what kids like to do. Kids don't like learning, right? Most kids do. I'm sure there's some kids who like learning. Most kids don't. Right? If they didn't, we would have a job, right? If kids just love learning, they just go do it on their own. If you think, think about the, you know, when I grew up in the 90s or whenever you grew up, right? Like, <laughs> like were the libraries teeming with kids filled with, like, an insatiable curiosity? Were they banging on the doors being like, open, it's eight already, like, let me in. You know, where kids complaining, like, I can't go to the library because I live too far away. I wish I had more access to knowledge right? That's not something that ever happened, right? And nobody's <laughs> ever talked to kids or stepped foot in a library would think that that's actually the case, right? right? Yeah. And so, so what we have to live in is, like I said, the reality. What are kids actually doing um, for that nine hours? And the, and the way it breaks down um, is the biggest chunk of time, that 39% is passive consumption. Passive consumption is watching, uh, watching videos. And very often, what I find most... Uh, puzzling is it's, they're very often watching videos of other people playing video games, um, which is weird. I have a 16-year-old. My, I, my kids are uh, 20, 16, and 4. Surprise. Um, <laughs> and uh, the 16-year-old, uh, if, if he's on his phone, almost assuredly he's looking at somebody playing a video game, which is mind-numbing to me. But at any rate, uh, it's, it's watching videos of, of they're on Netflix or whatever, right? passive consumption. Uh, 26% communication, so that's social media, texting, etc. Um, interactive consumption, 25% video games. Right? That's the interactive consumption. There's 7% of other, nobody seems to know what that is. And then it's the 3% that is the content creation. The content creation is the creative stuff where the, they're writing and they're you know, creating a, a movie that people can watch or whatever. That's the, the, the magical, really cool stuff about technology that can be done, it's just not being done that with, with any kind of regularity. 97% of that, of that nine hours is, 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 is consuming entertainment, right? And, and we all like to be entertained, and that's what it's about. And, and one of the things that we try and get across to, to kids whenever we talk to kid groups is that we would be no better, right? And, I, and I, I think probably most of us, if we really are honest, and you think of yourself when you were 14 or whatever, if you had infinite entertainment possibilities in your pocket 24 hours a day, we all probably would have made the same choices. Kids behave perfectly rationally. Um, I can be entertained as much as I want, so I'm going to be entertained as much as I want. And that's kind of the, the difficulty in, in having this conversation is it always sounds like you, were, you know, we're wagging a finger at them, and it's, it's really not because they're, and we're going to talk about this a little more later, there's a... Uh, video games and social media apps are intentionally made to be addictive and, and really difficult to, to put down. So we're putting kids in a really difficult spot. Yeah, and that was the message this morning to the students is, is this is not your fault. This is almost exploitative, or it is exploitative. The, these video games, social media, and now even, even things like Netflix are designed with the intent of keeping the user on for as long as possible. They're, they're being pulled from reality and thrust into a world, and it's exploiting their lack of prefrontal cortex, their lack of executive function, their fear of enhanced fear of missing out. It's exploiting that, and it's monetizing it, and it's sad, and it's depressing for us. So, so our, our goal today was to just try to convey that, but tonight I think we're going to look more deeply into the loss, the socio-emotional Loss. There's all kinds of negative consequences to spending a majority of your waking day in a digital world. There's all kinds of, of ways that that has a potential negative outcome. Um, tonight, again, the focus may be on socio-emotional. So we, we talked about the exploitative, uh, exploitative nature of 
the tech industry, and we're not trying to default them, right? There's a demand for this thing, but they're, they're trying to increase the, the potential targets, right? The average consumer has seven screens, so they, we need to find new consumers, right? Because they already have too many screens. What are we going to do? We're going to put, I don't know, TVs on their uh, refrigerator door? Oh, we already did that, right? right? So this is something we find particularly despicable. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a real thing, uh, the iPod-y. And so, so we have you know, kids today who, who are growing up with whenever they've been introduced to a cell phone or whatever, it, it probably was not, uh, you know, if they're, today they're 16, and probably when they were two, they didn't have an ipod -y. Um, but what's coming up is, is even more disconcerting because there's this, and it, it, it actually gets worse. Um, and, it's, and it's sad, right? Uh, the newborn uh, to toddler activity seat. And you'll see that it only luckily has two stars, so hopefully there's not too many people buying it. But uh, before a child can turn his head or control her head, the screen is snapped right there into the field of view. And so that becomes the kid's world, right? I can't move my head and this thing is here. Well, that's, that's reality. If that's the way your brain processes the world, if that becomes the world, well, then that's the world. And uh, the question that isn't being asked enough is, well, what's the long-term ramification? And the, the NIH is now doing a study. It's the first of its kind, a longitudinal study in there. Um, one of the really frustrating things about it is they did not use a control group of kids with zero technology. And we talked to the authors of the, of the study, and they said, well, the, the, there's no significant group. There's, there's no way we could find kids we with zero technology. We, we can't find them. That's what they said. Uh, which I, I, I reject that notion because we know, I mean, through our talking, we've found plenty of families who have, you know, don't even have a television that you could certainly have sought people out for. And I understand that it's maybe not the best science to seek people out, but... Um, there is a group out there to do that, but you know who knows what happens when we start kids out with that in place. So that that nine hours a day we looked at earlier that didn't include time in in schools. Um, so now the big push for the last three or four years has been how do we get these screens into schools, right? And it's it's masked under all kinds of different pretenses. But one thing is, oh, kids love screens. So where how do we meet them where they are? They're on screens. So let's go meet them. Right, so so this is kind of a model, and I think this is called uh, from from Rocket Ship Academy, and 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 it, it it's touted as personalized learning. Whatever, the, the kids are put in front of their own laptop and left into they call them learning labs, or they're just little cubicles uh, where they sit with their their Dre headbeats out on, cancel out the outside world in case there was extra sensory deprivation. They need less sensation. Right? Let's get them focused on the screen for four or five hours a day. Um, and, and so what happened, uh, I don't know if you saw this, this was in Brooklyn a, f a few months ago, they, uh, kids in one of these schools where they've, and, they, and there are, the, you know, that, that last picture showed a few kids, but they, what they're doing in some of these charter schools, particularly in, in uh, poor areas, is essentially warehousing kids, the giant cafeteria with 200 kids, a bunch of cubicles lined up, three or four people who aren't teachers, they're essentially just babysitters walking around making sure kids are on the screen all day long. That's really happened, that's a really a thing. Um, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg are, are spearheading Summit Learning and Rocket Ship Academies, and those, you can look those up if you want there. That's, that's a real thing, and, and at one of the schools, um, you know, see the Facebook design, this is uh, think, think about that for just two seconds, a Facebook design school? <laughs> What? <laughs> Why is that a thing that somebody would do? This is a public school. Right. And so the kids walked out. The kids said, we can't, uh, we're not doing it. Right? Now, so understand, the kids want to learn. I mean, we said that learning is difficult, but they would rather actually have to do the hard work of learning than sit, like they said, for sit for so long. Spends close to five hours a day on summit classes. Uh, the distraction's very tempting. I've seen playing games. This is a teacher quote. Uh, all we do is sit there. Um, and students can easily cheat on quizzes. That was a teacher quote. Uh, we've done absolutely nothing in that class, and, and we've done absolutely nothing because, the, you know, the, there's, there isn't any interaction between teacher and student. In fact, in one of these, I forget if it's Rocket Ship or Summit, where they said the goal is 15 minutes of teacher-student interaction a week. Um, is that Rocket Ship or Summit? That's uh, Rocket Ship. Okay. And that's the Gates one. And that, we got to ask ourselves, what's the, what's the cost to a child going to school all day long? And, and these were schools... Um, 
this rocket ship, uh, 50, 60, 70 students, uh, not, not you know, being supervised by somebody without teacher training. This is the uh, direction that Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg would like to see us go. Um, there were no talking, 45 minutes to an hour, we're talking about little kids. And, you know, this is really, this is sad. Like, even third graders were having bathroom accidents because they weren't allowed to get up from their, they had to work through their modules. And they, parents were told, send an extra pair of pants and underwear with your kid because they're probably going to pee themselves. Um, that's totally, I mean, can you imagine hearing that as a parent? Um, and, and what happens in education, we were talking to the teachers earlier today, and education's funny um, because we're taking advice from, <laughs> from Bill Gates um, and Mark Zuckerberg, both who are obviously very bright and they've done really well for themselves, but they're not teachers and they're not principals and they're not superintendents and they're not people who've committed their lives to, to helping kids, um, at least not in schools. And Bill Gates recently uh, tried to, to develop a, a plan for uh, increasing nuclear energy usage. And... Um, we're not taking a position on nuclear energy one way or the other, but, but nuclear physicists essentially just shut him down and said, that's preposterous, you're not a nuclear physicist, this would never work, whatever his plan was, I don't pretend to understand it. Um, and they shut him down and said, no way. But in education, we hear Bill Gates is doing something, we go, well, well Bill Gates said we should do it, so let's do it. And, and this is a, you know, these rocket ship schools and summer schools are, are out there. And, um, and so it, it really, it brings up a, a really sad moment in, in psychology. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things I teach psychology, and, and I, I love the work of Harry Harlow, and, and Harry Harlow studied uh, monkeys, and he said this because they're social primates like us, um, and one of his most famous studies, he gave monkeys a choice between uh, cold wire mom, and he actually, to make it more enticing, he'd put a bottle here, and then a, a cuddly mom. Um, and, and this was uh, done in the 50s and 60s when parents were told to have a kind of a, a more distant relationship with your kids. You don't cuddle and kiss your kids too often was a co common parenting advice, and, and too often was once a year. Um, so, so this kind of idea, do we want a cold relationship with our kids or a warm cuddling relationship? And, and what he found is not surprising to us today that the, the, the monkeys overwhelmingly preferred the cuddly cloth moms. And they would, they would spend almost the entire day cuddling with the mom and they would even just climb over the partition and feed off of the wire mom. You know, and, and Harry Harlow found that something that we know to be true today is that kids need social interaction. We are social people. We need that. Um, he took it, his work gets really dark, and he started depriving, he put them in what he called a pit of despair, and he'd just isolate monkeys for up to a year. And then what would happen to them? And not surprisingly, they would be severely psychologically damaged they would spend so much time in isolation that they would become damaged. They'd be overly anxious. They would be depressed. They would be uh, prone to violent outbursts. You know, kind of the, a lot of the things we describe today with, with some of the problems around kids. And so th that sad problem takes on a human form in studies like what was done at University of Pennsylvania. Um, this was just this past year, I think December, this study came out. And Melissa Hunt said, uh, I want uh, to do this study. And so she took a bunch of UPenn students, and half of them were the control group, and, and half of them were the study group. And they, everybody took a psychological health exam at the beginning of the, of the study period, and they all got some score for their psychological health, whatever it was. The control group continued to use social media. She was studying specifically social media. The control group continued to use social media in the way they had been using it. And the study group reduced their social media use to 45 minutes a day. And they were all using much more than 45 minutes a day. And they all reduced this in the study group to 45 minutes a day. They did that for three weeks or a month or something. And then at the end, they took that same psychological health uh, test. And probably not surprisingly, the people who reduced their social media usage came up with a higher psychological health score. Okay, well, that's, that's interesting. I mean, it might be a little predictable, but it's interesting that that really happened. When Matt and I read the study, we said, well, that's, that is interesting, but what would be more interesting is if you could prove the reverse. Could you, could you have the control group continue to use social media the way they do, and then have the study group increase their social media use? Could you tell them, hey, use, if you're using it three hours a day, use it six hours a day? And so I, we got in touch with her and said, hey, 
could you do that? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be interesting? And she emailed back right, almost right away and said, couldn't do it, it would be unethical. And so I replied and said, can you elaborate? And so she gave us permission to use this. She said, it would be unethical because we already have considerable correlational research linking more use to worse outcomes, knowing that we wouldn't want to cause harm. Okay, it would be unethical <laughs> to have kids increase, on purpose, make study participants increase their social media use. Yet in schools all the time, we're told, hey, use Facebook in your classroom, use Twitter in your classroom, use you know, Snapchat, figure out a way to meet kids where they are, and you know, they love using social media, so use in your classroom. Intentionally make them use more social media. Something that you would, she said, any ethical review board would shoot this down. Just couldn't do the study. And she drew the comparison to uh, foods. You know, if there was a food that you knew caused cancer, uh, or you, you had correlational data that caused cancer, you could never tell a study group, hey, eat more of that food because you would be you know, potentially causing people to have more cancer. It's the same thing here. You couldn't do it because we know there's so much bad stuff that comes out of it. Yet in schools, uh, we get this. Project RED is the uh, consortium of ed tech firms that um, is, RED stands for Revolutionizing Education. Um, and they're, so they're really pushing this idea to use more. Did um, you want to go over this? Yeah. So we have this uh, use of social, if we're talking about social media, teens are using a lot more social media than they used to. You see the blue is uh, 2012 and then the, the more recently. So this is, 2012 is often picked as a, as a benchmark in these studies because it was 2012 where the smartphone became, uh, I don't know what you call it, but I think it was more than half of teenagers had a smartphone by 2012. So right in 2012 and then, and then looking at today, um, and you'll see that the more than once a day, the, uh, the number's way up. So kids are using a lot more social media. 16% yeah, so almost constantly. That's pretty impressive. Right. Um, and the kids using it once a day, you know, it's way down. So we know kids are using a lot more social media. But what's happening to their mental well-being scores? Um, and you'll see, you know, what's interesting is that this is on the, on the bottom part, the, the x-axis is the digital screen engagement, how many hours per day. And you'll notice the mental well-being actually increases a little bit right in, the, right in the beginning. For a little bit of social media use, seems to be a good thing right off the bat. But, but the problem is, of course, they're made to be, those apps are made to be so addictive, almost nobody's using it for 45 minutes or an hour a day. And so the, the, there's this precipitous decline in um, well-being the more you use uh, social media. And to bring this back to Harry Harlow, yeah. excuse me. What, what they found when they, they tried to reintroduce the monkeys back into population is that the monkeys would gravitate towards cloth bomb, that, and that's true. Um, but when you try to introduce these, these monkeys back to the general population, I don't know if that's what they'd call it, but, but they, they were totally lacking socialization, right? Even though they had a cuddly mom that was responsive in there all the time, it wasn't real, it was artificial, and there wasn't an actual interaction. And those monkeys were still very maladjusted, and they struggled to fit in with society. The problem with social media is it's exactly that. It's the wire and cloth moms of the world. It's not the same as a face-to-face -face interaction. It's extremely two-dimensional. It's extremely lacking. It doesn't have the, the, the anywhere near the depth of emotional connection that we see in an actual face-to-face -face interaction. And you can see it when you talk to kids. You know, when you talk to kids all the time, the, one of the things that teachers say all the time now is, look at me, 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 right? Because as soon as you start talking to a kid, their eyes go down because <laughs> they're not used to that face. It makes them uncomfortable. Um, they're uncomfortable in so, in, because they live, their social interactions are in a very two-dimensional, lacking lives. They're not socialized. This is preferable to them. We, we talked about the brain gravitates towards the path of least resistance. If I give you something that's easy or something that's hard, a rational person is going to gravitate towards something that's easy. Well, social media is very easy. Kids prefer texting over calling or definitely over face-to-face. -face. Why? Well, I can think about my response. I can come up with something witty. Um, I do, you know, and it's easy, right? It, bullying is easy, right? I can say all of the mean things I think and then not even have to deal with the consequences, right? It's, there it goes. It's often the either. 
right? I don't have to look at that kid crying. I don't have to see the anguish on his face. I don't have to live in that reality. It's, it's, it's in a far inferior method of existence. And it, social media is great for old people like us, right, who we grew up with this skill, and it augments that existing skill. I, I know not to say hurtful things because I did it when I was a kid, and I was on the receiving end of it, and I bullied kids too, right, and I've learned, oh, that, you know, that just doesn't feel well. So I don't, I'm not a troll. I don't cyber bully, right? But if this is all you've ever known, if this is all you ever grew up with, this is your, your cloth mom, your, your wire mom, right? It's still not good enough. And we see a result. We see a result of kids who just struggle. And they struggle, and we see it every single day. Um, and so you see the, you know, the, there's a mental health ec epidemic uh, in America, and particularly among young people. And, uh, you know, is it, is it all 100% of fault of uh, overuse of screen time? Probably not, but boy, it sure plays a, a significant role. Um, you can go ahead. So um, the big question is, how can we help our kids? Um, that's what this is all about. That's why you're here. That's why we're here. Um, and we would say the, f the first thing is to help them track use of their phones. And this, this is good for, for all of us to do. If, if, if you don't or they don't have an app on their phone, that says how many times you're checking your phone and how much of the day you're spent looking at your phone. It can be really instructive because kids will often say, nah, I don't use it that much, if you ask them to self-report. Because in their world where everybody's using a phone all day long, it doesn't seem like that much. It doesn't seem disordered or anything out of the ordinary. But if you say to them, you know, well, what did, your, what did your little tracker say at the end of the day? Holy mackerel, it was nine and a half hours. I had no idea. Um, so just, just that alone can be a, a significant deterrent to a kid when they realize, oh, wow, of the, of the, whatever, 16 hours that I was awake, seven of it was spent looking at my phone. So that, that can help, just tracking the use. Next thing we say is, is limit. Now, now, we use the word limit. And I, always, I always feel for the, the kids who get dragged to these things. They're just sitting between two parents, and the parents are nudging <laughs> them, and they're just like, uh, the whole time, right? Like, like... Joe and I played games growing up. I, you know, he played Atari or something, right? Like I played. I had he Sega said Genesis. he said Pong earlier, so I, I have got upgraded different? to Atari. Yeah, it's just different. Okay. Um, you know, and and we would and, and, and we would disengage for the world and do something that was like you know just mindless and, and stupid, but kind of fun. And, and, and we it, it it was kind of a way to chill and just for some downtime. Um, and, and, and that was okay, right? It, but we weren't doing it for nine hours a day. We weren't spending nine, most of our waking day engaged in a mindless activity. So we'd say uh, be especially aware of gaming apps, right? Like Space Invader, which is the point. Like this wasn't designed for the intent of keeping right. users using it all day long. I don't know. Does anybody recognize that, Space Invaders? Okay, yeah. So. Uh, that is not particularly <laughs> engaging. This the, you know, the back and forth and then pressing the button. I forget how you held the thing, but you know, whatever. You can do that for a little while. It's kind of amusing, but it wasn't made to be. Uh, there was no what's called persuasive design. There are video game designers who have come out and said, "Look, we're trying to find ways." And they, they, the casino operators use the same tricks to get people playing the games and get people intentionally get people addicted. That hadn't been done in the 70s and 80s when they, you know, they were inventing games like Space Invaders, so we could put them down. And they had to be played on your TV, right? And your TV was a piece of furniture, and you couldn't carry it everywhere. And so, you know, you, it was there. Well, you know what? I'd really rather go over there. And so you just couldn't, you know, it wasn't a thing to spend nine hours doing. Um, so the, it's the limit. It's, and it's not, you know, getting rid of. Does a kid need some downtime? Sure, of course. It's the limiting. And so, you know, if we can agree on what a sensible limit looks like in, in uh, all of our houses, that, that can be helpful. Social media, same way, made to be addictive. Yeah, I mean, and then, like, we all grew up with this. This, was, this wasn't addictive, right? Because you could, <laughs> you'd, have to, you'd have to stand next to it, right? And it didn't make sense. Your mom was always listening on the other end. Right. Like, yeah, your little, this was a tool. Little brother or sister would pick up the other receiver yeah. and hear what you're saying to your... This, this, this was a tool to meet up, right? So this, this would just be to facilitate the plans. It wasn't it, in lieu of connecting. It was how to, right? Right. And, and the other thing we'd say is, is, is turn off the notifications, right? A lot of parents are uncomfortable with, with the idea of kids not having. We, we run into one of the biggest pushbacks of, of having schools that just 
don't allow phones at all as parents want to stay connected um, in case there's an emergency. Uh, you know, it's unfortunately the society we live in today with, with you know, whatever goes on. Um, but, but okay, that's fine, maybe. But why not turn off all the other notifications? Why not silence your Facebook, your Instagram, your email? I don't know if kids, do kids get emails. Um, you know, Snapchat. Snapchat. I mean, I mean, it's unreal the number of notifications they get. Yeah, they. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen this. There was a teacher who did a did an experiment with her kids. She was taught middle school, and she said, "I want everybody to turn your phone all the way up. Put to turn your notifications all the way up." And then, and then she put headings on the board. You know, uh, text, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook. You know, whatever. And come up here, and you know, every time you get a notification for one of these, put a little hash mark. And this, this picture kind of went sort of viral. It was a picture of this butcher block piece of paper, and it was covered with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things. And she did it for, I think she did it for like a half an hour. And um, I saw it and thought, well, that's really interesting. And I, I, so I went in the next day and I told my kids, take out your phones, put them on your desk, turn your notifications all the way up, and just nobody say anything. Don't touch your phone. Just don't say anything. And it was like an old time arcade. Just beep, beep, beep. Just every, every second there was, a, there was another notification going off. And about a minute, I said, we're going to do it for two minutes. And about a minute in, a kid raised his hand and goes, are you trying to make a point or something? <laughs> yeah, I am trying to make a point. Um, and so if part of it is, and again, these are things that are always vying for our attention, right? And so if you turn the notifications off, and if, you do, if you're old like me and you don't really know what that means, like on... On these apps, you know, they, they notify you when something comes in. You got a text or a snap or whatever, and you can turn those off. And so, if we can have kids, especially during key parts of the day, like being in school, turn those off, that then that thing doesn't become as demanding of, of your attention because it constantly you feel it buzzing all the time. You can't not look, right? Maybe somebody ate something really cool last night. I got to got to see what that was. Um, and, and one of the things we encourage families to do, and this isn't just kids, it's families, is, is check your phones at the door. We talk to a lot of parents who have a little charging station wherever they, they walk in. And policy is when, as soon as you come in the house, leave it there, and that's where it is. Um, you know, that's important, that time to disconnect. One of the things we talked about in the faculty, the faculty meeting is kids struggle today because they, they can't disconnect. They're, they're, you know, if, if in the 80s and 90s you were having problems at school, when you got home, that was a sanctuary from that, and you, you could take solace in that. Uh, kids can't today check out. They don't have that. It follows them everywhere they go, and it, it must be so daunting. Um, they need that time away. They need that mental downtime. It's, it, it's true for all of us. The, I mean, you can't pump gas anymore, right? The GSTV, the, there's a screen on the gas pump so that you, you never have to be alone with your thoughts. Um, and, it's, it's, and that's just kind of become the, the way things are, but that doesn't mean we have to, to, to accept that. Um, and so we would, we would say another kind of sub-point of checking your phone at the door is that phones, phones don't go into bedrooms um, and phones aren't used at meals. That you know the meal time is for for family family talk and the and the bedroom is for you know lots of activities but not not phone because that you know it's very isolating and it's difficult to find out what they're what's going on in there what what are they doing on their phone while they're over in their bedroom and I would add to one more thing to that that disconnection piece is they need time and I know this is hard to hear you all love your kids very much that's why you're here and, and technology is a draw for them it's a draw for us we love our kids. So we want to, it allows us constant connection with the things we love most in the world. And, and that draw is powerful for our, us as parents as well. So we use it as a tool to stay connected to our kids, but it doesn't allow them a chance, the developmental test, chance to, to learn coping skills. We did a, a talk to a PTA uh, a few months ago, and um, they were considering it. You know, we were second on the docket. The first thing on the docket was, uh, a real fire they had had in the school. Um, and a fire had started in a bathroom and um, during the middle of a transition period between classes and they never practiced that. They never had a fire drill in the middle of classes. And this mom stood up and she goes, that's ridiculous. My kid didn't know what to do. So she had to get out her phone and call me and ask me because no teachers were telling her what to do in the fire, right? So I had to tell her to go out the door. What? 
Your daughter's 16 years old. There's a fire. Why don't you walk out the door? Why does your mom need to tell you that at 16? Right? You need to learn coping skills. A child needs to develop resiliency, to develop this. They need that time apart. They need that time to, to try out things. And it's very hard for a parent. We want to protect our kids. Um, we want to we wanna be there for them at all times. But, but, but so often that, that can sometimes be debilitating to a child. They, they, they use it as a crutch because they love you too. Right? When, we first, when phones first started coming out, a kid, you, a kid would be texting. You'd be like, you know, let me see that. And you look at it. He's like, I'm texting my mom. You're like, yeah, right. You look at it. No, he is texting his mom. Uh, almost always, right? Like kids yearn for that, and you yearn for it. Um, but sometimes they need that disconnect. They need that time to figure things out and deal with issues, and then and then convey those messages to you once they get home. So, you know, I had a hard day today. Let me talk about it to to your face, right? And finally, we would say that we want kids to revel in AR, actual reality. Um, and at Georgetown University. Uh, did this great thing. I thought it was a great thing. They had a, they sold tickets for their basketball games, uh, and they had an, an actual reality section. And in the actual reality section, you couldn't bring your phone, but they did things like behind the section, they had a station where you could write letters and postcards, like by hand. You take a selfie with a Polaroid. Right. Yeah. You get right. You take a selfie with a Polaroid camera and stuff. So they kind of made a little gimmick out of it, but it's it really highlights an important point, which is that there's so much beautiful stuff going on in in our homes in the world and just outside, that that's where we want kids to really revel. And, and if they need some downtime playing video games, that's a, you know, it's a separate issue. And you know, we can, we can, reasonable people can, can talk about what a, what a reasonable limit looks like. But uh, the, you know, life, of course, is happening uh, not here, not on the phone. And, and real life, real relationships are the most important things in a child's lives. And that's, and that's where you come in and, and you know, the, this, if your, your kids go here, you're, you're very fortunate. We got to spend time today, and, and this is such a tight-knit community of great people. They're very, they're very close to the kids, and, and that's what they need. They need adults in their lives who care about them, and they need real-life interactions. They don't need more virtual reality, right? Like, I got that. Like, virtual, we try to, like, they're touting this new thing. Virtual reality is so great. Yeah, it's, it's okay. It means almost, right? Like, it's almost as good as real reality, right? <laughs> Um, we're going we're gonna to leave you with this just because this is uh, what a, um, uh, this is, we, we use this with our own students about, in this, it's talking about focus, and so I, I don't actually know if in a room this size this is going to work, but if you could, see that green dot in the middle, s s try really hard, it, and it's difficult from that distance, but try really hard to stare only at that green dot, and focus all of your attention just on that green dot, nothing else but that green dot. Is something happening? The what? The other dots disappear. Yeah, uh, if you're if you're able to, it's much easier to do it in a, like a small classroom. But what happens is the other dots disappear. And if you look, the other dots aren't actually disappearing; they're still there. Um, but that when you tell your brain the green dot is the only thing that matters, your brain will literally say those other things don't even exist. Okay. Well, the green dot is the kid's screen, and your your voice is that gr the, the, the dots on the outside. Okay, so when we're in class, and you know, the, the, the dots on the outside, are, that's our voice. Um, you know, even if it's just a quick, well, I'm just going to check my phone because I got a, a thing or whatever. There's no way, nobody can multitask. You hear that phrase a lot, that kids can multitask. And, and nobody can, it's not a kid thing or an adult thing. Nobody can multitask. You can't truly pay attention to two unfamiliar things at the same time. And um, so this is, we kind of wanted to leave you with that because this is what we're, we're doing all over society is asking kids to be able to pay attention to this, but also some other stuff. And it just, it really is kind of setting kids up for failure. And we, we want to set kids up for success as much as we can. Um, and we appreciate really your, your attention. We'd love to hear questions or comments if you have anything that you'd like to, to share with us or ask. Um, yes. The question was, do we have statistics on the percentage of kids who have phones and percentage that don't have phones? I know that as of 2012, a majority of teenagers had phones, had smartphones. Um, 
Yeah, and that was 2012. Today, I would say the, the number of teenagers that have a smartphone, um, I mean. 70s to 80s, I think. Uh, I would say, I, I was gonna say even higher, but okay. yeah, I mean, it's, it's approximately 100% of the kids we teach, and that might just be a function of the uh, area in which we teach, but the, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, I would say it's ubiquitous in a lot of areas. And, and so much so that you're, when, as a parent, you're, you're again in a hard, Right. If if you're the the only parent who doesn't give his kid yeah. the smartphone, you you he could very well be one of the few kids in the whole school that do, doesn't have a smartphone, right? Yeah. And, and well, that's where I was going. So how how do you what suggestion do you have for the few of us who don't believe in any of that? Right. When you try to teach them something that they don't believe. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. Yes, my. My son, my, my sons both said it that they were they were the only one, and I so I got him a little uh, a little you know what they call a burner cell phone that just it would it would you know you could make a phone call and you could text, but you had to text like tick, 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 you know that I forget what that's called, but then you had to punch the seven key three times to get the S or whatever, um, and so he rejected it, and it, and I would say well you know take this to school if you need to call me after school for a ride or whatever, and and he would never take it anyway, he would always lose it or leave it at home or whatever, he never, never, it was better to have nothing than to have this horrendous thing. Uh, the, the suggestion that we have is that, and, and this is, this is bit, such a nice community, that if, if you can work with other parents in the neighborhood and say, hey, let's, let's, let's agree on some, some, some common principles here. And, and there's, a, um, there's a group that was started by um, some uh, moms in Texas. It's called Wait Until Eighth, and they ask people to sign this pledge that I'm going to wait until eighth grade to get my kid a, a smartphone. Um, and, and that's, it, you don't have to necessarily sign that one pledge, but there, there, are, there is a movement out there, and there are, you might feel very alone, but you're, you're for sure not, um, that there are parents in the community who will agree. And then if, you know, if, you, know you, you know that your kid's friend's parents and you're all kind of wrestling with the idea, if you can all kind of get out ahead of it and say, let's, let's agree that it's going to be eighth grade or ninth grade or never in high school or, or whatever. It makes it easier because then the kid knows, all right, it's me and these three other kids are the, are the only ones, but at least it's not just me, you know? And, 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 it's, and you're right, that's a, that's a tremendously difficult one. Yeah, and so much of what we try to do is, is the grassroots level, right? Because as teachers, we can only do so much. We're battling 32 kids with cell phones, per right? Class. Like, it needs to be a movement, you know, and yeah. as, as cheesy as that sounds, like it needs to be, there needs to be a demand to reclaim our children. And, and it's out there. Are there other uh, questions? Yes. Um, along the same line, my kids have been asking, oh, how old are they before I get a cell phone? Um, and it's been Yeah, um, the wait until eighth. We 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 dug around a little bit. We're we're um, supporters. We're on the on the the advisory board for wait until eighth. And when we dug around a little bit, they picked eighth grade because it, it kind of rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> wait until eighth. So uh, there was there wasn't really any science behind that or anything. So I think it has to be. That's that's a very individual decision. I know that my older son. Um, was and is much more responsible about his cell phone usage than my than my younger son, and I, I kind of and the deal I made with him was high school, um, and if, and I kind of wish I had waited uh, for my younger son, and that and that would have been a, a miserable conversation to have, right? Because he knows that his older brother got one in ninth grade, and then I'm going to make him wait till he's in eleventh grade or whatever. But um, I would say I would say certainly to me, uh, elementary school is way too young, and and that's most elementary, or not, I don't want to say most, but many, many elementary school kids have smartphones um, that are on them, you know, all day long. So I don't know. I, I would tend to say it had the. It would really kind of depend on the on the kid and how well they handle responsibility for something like that because it's a, it's an enormous responsibility. I would, I would actually say before driving or after driving, but not at 16, because boy, trying to put both of those that's a real dangerous combination. Um, and so they either need to know how to manage the phone ahead of time or know how to manage the car ahead of time and then get the phone. But I don't think 16 to me seems like a, um, a, a tough age to make that happen. I'm sorry, I didn't give a better answer for that. Um, 
Do you have uh, other, other questions, commentary? Yeah. Yeah, and I know it sounds like we're giving more questions than answers, but one of the things we regularly say to teacher groups is you should really stop giving all of your homework online. Your, your parents want to limit kids' screen use, but we're making it impossible for you, right? Because we're saying you have to go home and use your laptop. And once you open up that Pandora's box, right, they go up into their room, they're doing their history homework for four and a half hours. Like, wow, it's so hard, right? They, you didn't know it was like a one-page reading. Um, so... <laughs> So, yes, yeah, schools are making it challenging, too, and that's a message we convey to, to schools. You know, the, the, at, at the very least, take homework offline, right? And as a parent, you can, if you're really struggling with that, your kid, I would go to the teachers and I'd say, we really want to limit their screen use at home. Is there a paper version of the book? Like, we have online textbooks. So if you want to do a reading, you have to log on to the Internet. Well, once you open up the laptop, now I've welcomed in every friend you've ever met. Uh, you know, all the games you could possibly play, Netflix, right? How could Hammurabi's code complete with, compete with, like, season three of Friends, right? It's just not that entertaining. Um, nothing I teach is, right? So, I mean, Jennifer Annes, come on. Yeah. Uh, the, I, I would agree totally that, that uh, schools, schools play a key role in that and, and have to live in the reality. You know, we're talking about meeting kids where they are. The reality is if kids are overusing screen time, and we know they are, outside of school, then we need to react to that in schools. Um, and it's, yeah, that's a, that's a, I don't know. I, I, I wish, you know, from the inside, we're trying to kind of change things from the inside, but you're, uh, you're right on there. Other uh, thoughts, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, well, I think the, if I'm, are you talking about this one? Yeah. Um, you're talking about what is the, what is the mental well-being test? Yeah, what's the test, how do they score it, and how significant is that four points left off? Um, the test is, you mean, like the name of the test? Uh, I mean, what the test consists of. That's a, that's a good question. You're right, I, I, should have, I should do more homework on exactly what the test consists of. Um, it it I, was developed by psychologists, and it's just on like levels of depression and things like that. I don't know the specific, but what I would say is, is you're right. Look at that zero time and then up. You know, tech advocates. I've read tech advocates call this a U-shaped trend, um, an inverse U, obviously. But but they'll say like, well, there are some benefits to social media use, right? Because look, there's a huge increase right here. I don't, I don't. First of all, what kid was on screen zero times? Right, that's a kid being punished, right? <laughs> so I think that may count for that, that, that slight drop off, right? That's probably a pretty small sample size too, but. Um, and I would also say that when you go from 48, whatever, whatever the well-being score is, you go from a 48 down to a, let's say a 44, it's, you know, four points, four out of 40 is a 10% difference. Um, 
which I think is statistically significant. That was the point of the study, was it was statistically significant. And, and again, you're right, I, we should probably know more about this particular study, but that's a, that's a fair question. Um, the point to me that I would take away from it is that more, more uh, screen engagement leads to lower mental health outcomes. Um, I think that's what the main thing you can take away from that. And, and you might say that, well, I mean, maybe it's just that it, the correlation, not causation, maybe it's just that more depressed kids gravitate towards, and that, and that could be true too, right? Um, but what, what you can't walk away from this saying is that it, it's good for you, right? There's, there, there, there may not be causation, but it certainly isn't correlation that the more time you're on this, it's, it's not an adequate replacement for actual um, human interaction. Uh, other questions? Comments? Yeah, Change policies because of what we said, or be, or change policies in general. Um, yeah, well, there are there are not just school systems, but there are countries. Uh, France, uh, for, <laughs> for instance, banned cell phones uh, nationwide in classrooms. Ontario, Canada, the whole uh, province, just for next year, uh, is banning cell phones in school. So there are. This is a. The, the United States is is pretty far behind on this. The um, the the. Diagnostic manual they use in psychological health is the DSM four or five, they're way up to five now, five. Um, and in the United States, we don't recognize screen addiction as, a, as an addiction. It says in there something like it, it needs further study. Almost every other industrialized country in the world that has something like that has screen addiction specifically listed and they have special screen addiction, essentially detox centers where they will send people, but kids in particular. Um, so the, there, there's, a, there's a recognition of this issue worldwide and we're kind of just, just catching up to that. Um, and then one of the things that, that we would recommend, first and foremost, would be taking cell phones out of classes. And one of the arguments people will give us is, well, how are we supposed to teach kids to use their cell phones or their technology um, responsibly? And sometimes responsible use means not using it. That's responsible use. If you're in church or you're eating dinner with your family or whatever, that's a, that's a no cell phone time. And uh, a classroom is a, really needs to be a, a no cell phone time. So that would be you know, one of the, that and like Matt said, uh, dropping uh, online homework would be two good starter steps. Um, you had a question back there. I'll give you the best question that, that I know of is to ask whoever, whoever is, is spearheading the rollout, you want to ask, what reservations do you have about this? Okay, and if, if they say none, then you're not, you're not talking to somebody who has a reasonable view of what's happening. Because there's no way that you could see what's, there's, you either, what you're talking to is somebody who either is, is woefully uninformed or they're choosing to ignore all the information that's out there. Neither of those things are reasonable if you're going to do this uncontrolled experiment on kids. Yeah, I mean, they're already in the classroom. Okay. So you see, it, so I, would still, I, would still ask, I would still ask, what concerns do you have about this? You, as you walk around the, your school and you see kids you know, typing all day long, what concerns do you have about that? That's the first one. The second question that I think is critical now that they're there is, in what way is this better than the analog version? How is this better for kids? Not as good as. How is it better? Because hey, we're supposed to be doing the best thing for kids. So what is, the, what is better about this thing? Why is it better that the kid's on the online textbook? Why is it better that the kid is on Google Classroom? Why is that better for a child? 
And, and that's a difficult question to answer from, from the pro-tech side because you can say, well, you know, 21st century skills. Well, 21st century skills actually look a lot like 18th century skills. The 21st century skills are the ability to think critically, to problem solve, to lead, to communicate. Um, it, those are all the things that, if you look at the World Economic Forum list of, of 21st century skills, and you look at Forbes Magazine's list of 21st century works, workplace skills, zero of them include technology use. What, what type of device? Is it a tablet or is it a Chromebook? Okay. One of the things too we see is is the the functionality of a tablet is very limited, um, as far as learning or learning apps are concerned. It's normally to gamify learning is is what a lot of the younger. I as a parent I would want to I would want to see the, the the tracker information on that, and a lot of schools will block that, um, and I would push back against that. I want to know what exactly my what apps they're on and for how long, because what a lot of parents will find out is they're they're not on even the school apps. They're, they're spending a lot of time gaming. They're gaming at, instead of going out to recess. They're, you know, they're, they're doing other things. So I would want, if you're going to give my kids something that is essentially a toy nine hours a day, I want to know what they're doing in school with it um, so that I can keep track of my kid. Because that's your right as a parent, right? If you want to limit their access to YouTube, you want to limit their access to Minecraft or games or something, right? Why would a school have the right to tell you, no, you can't do that? So I would push back. I, I'm, I'm shocked at the number of schools who will disable the tracking app on. The okay. Tracking it. Tracking effectiveness yeah. of no. the specific apps. The, and here's the, here's the problem with that is there's so much new stuff coming out all the time, and these companies come up with a new app and it's just thrown in this. And it, it's it's like an exped. People call it the the widest experiment ever conducted on our children, right? They throw these apps out and they're gone like that. They can't keep track of these. Very, um, very difficult to do a real study in real time when these apps are getting rolled out. And so, so, but that's another, to go back to your first question, that's a really good question to ask is, where, can you show me some data that says this is going to help make my kid happier, healthier, and more successful? And the answer will be no. Um, I mean, you, because the data just don't exist, and that's, that's the, a problem, is the, is the data need to be there. Um, now, one of the things that we've recently discovered, and that we're going to be uh, probably writing more on once we get the, the full details, but it, um, Johns Hopkins gets um, a lot of contracts to evaluate the effectiveness of a one-to-one -one program. Um, Johns Hopkins and Stanford both, which are both excellent schools. Uh, it, you can go right on the, on the website of the people that, that are running these studies, and you can see where they're getting grants from, and they get... An, the people who run the, the studies evaluating the effectiveness of a particular app are getting money from those app designers, and then they're doing the evaluation of the app. Well, that's a, obviously an enormous conflict of interest. So I look with a very skeptical eye at you know, anything that comes out um, you know, evaluating that where there's that kind of conflict of interest. Even with all that money, too, you're talking about like half a million dollars just for John Hopkins. I mean, they, they're still finding that there's no, I don't know the exact study, but there's still a finding that there's no improvement of test scores right. as a result. What they'll say is, oh, kids are more engaged. How do you measure kid engagement, right? Like you ask, hey, do you like playing Oregon Trail, right? Is it a shock? <laughs> the kids are more engaged. Yeah. Uh, but if they're not learning, why are you spending a billion dollars on this? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Sure, yeah. And so one of the places she, she said, would, uh, you know, if we're talking about word processing, are we talking about screen time? And, and we, the, the two things we, we talk about are purposeful, intentional use of technology. Purposeful, intentional use. And so if there is a purpose, I'm trying to teach a kid a skill, keyboarding. They have to know how to type or whatever. Well, of course, I mean, you're going to need a screen for that. If you're going to teach a kid how to write a computer program, obviously you need a screen for that. The example that I give all the time in, in talks is when I was in college at, at JMU, I took an astronomy class. The textbook had a paper star map in the front. The textbook was printed in Iowa, so the map was good for one night a year if you were in Iowa. Um, it was a useless map, right? But if you put Google Sky, which is free, on your phone, then during the day, at night, whatever, you could point it up at the sky and say, well, that's what's up there right now, and that's what they're looking at in China. If I point it down at the ground, it'll show you anywhere in the world what is in the sky at any time of day. Wow, is that cool. So that is an intentional, purposeful use. If I'm an astronomy teacher, I would, of course, want that on there. If you're trying to teach a kid how to type a paper and what, you know, what mar how to set margins or whatever, yeah, absolutely. There's, there are intentional, purposeful, productive uses that, that uh, where, again, the, the answer to the question is, how is this better? Well, this is better because this is the best thing available. And, and, and we would say, too, there's a dichotomy between useful technology and not. Like, we love word processing. We wrote a book with it, right? We didn't type it on a typewriter or whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, we did all of our research on it. But, but the, the couple of things about that, you know, we're adults, right? We, we have a, a more for, uh, fully formed prefrontal cortex so we can resist temptations, right? Even that's hard. I'm still like checking my emails every once in a while. Um, but, but we can use it like adults. A child is going to use uh, technology like, like a child, right? So the, our pushback would be that, that if you want that, right, you want to try, you have to have, an, as an adult, you have to have an Orwellian amount of control, right? And, and that sounds bad, but, but, but leave a kid alone with a device and they're going to treat it like a toy. Um, because they're a child, and that's, that's to be expected, right? So we would say, look, if, you, if your kid needs a laptop for their homework, have them do it right there at the dinner table while you're cooking dinner, right? Be there next to them. Um, you know, if, as a teacher, you want your kids to, to be on a word processor and research. I have my kids use technology for, for different projects and research. Um, I have to... I have to get up out of my chair and walk around. Right? So much we see in technologies, you know, let kids learn at their own pace. Let them choose their own methods, right? Kids will choose the slowest pace possible, right? Because they're, they're, that's expected, right? Like I said, hey, you have no deadlines anymore. You can learn at your own pace. Like, this is going to be the easiest 189 days of the year. That well, last day is going to be really hard, but, you know, like... <laughs> But, but you need to, to, to kind of be on top, and, and, and I guess that gets back to that bit about using, um, you know, learning how to use technology appropriately. Of course there are great things. Um, we argue that it's, it's hard for a child to realize that potential. There is a tremendous amount of potential technology has. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, I think we're, are we over time here? Okay, uh, the, are there more questions? Yes. We, uh, yeah, we are, we are work with uh, Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood, and, and we're part of a group right now that is developing a, a toolkit, um, which is that exact thing. And it'll, it'll include handouts with questions to ask your school, um, opt-out letters, if you, know, you want to try and opt your, your kid out of a, a program. Um, but it will also have a, a, um, some slides of, you know, prepared that you could take and alter and so on that we, you know, some of the stuff that we had here. 
Um, and we're going to try and we're going to make that available. In fact, our goal, I think, is to be done in the next six months. But um, and we can communicate that to you through the school, I guess, and and we can get that we can get the word out once it's live and, and available for everyone. But yeah, that's it, it, you're totally right. This is a great opportunity for uh, you know, the, the the classic teachable moment. And, and one of our goals here, we're still learning a lot about the brain, right? So so the, 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 they keep saying this is the largest study ever conducted um, on on children. Um, we're still learning, like the NA or the NA NIH study. Yeah, I mean that's a huge uh, study. They just started. We're starting to now just get the results. It's going to be ten years before we get all of the results. And we don't know a lot about brain development. We're still learning about it. Um, but what we do know is there's a billion dollars being spent on convincing the public that it is an unequivocal good. We get, you know, we're the, we find, you know, people ask us, what's so controversial about your book? What's controversial about our book is that our book is controversial, right? We're arguing that, that screen overusing something is bad. And the number of people who, whoa, you can't say that, right? Like, that's unbelievable. So, so one of our goals is just to start the conversation, right? Like, what is what is a world look like in the future? And it's not to let's go back to let's let's take the tablets out and give them the old hoop and stick and let them run, you know. <laughs> but but how do we raise kids in this future? And and un unfortunately, a lot of that's unknown. But but what we do have is two hundred thousand years of human experience to go back on and say that the world is not. The, the toys are more, the technology is really cool and there's a lot of it, but that hasn't changed our DNA. We are still in, inherently the same you know, species we've always been and our needs haven't changed and we still need to find a way to meet our needs in the upcoming future. Right. Oh, yeah. If you did not touch a screen, you're not going to feel good. Right. Yeah. Now, of course, you, out of one hour of the day, you, you were sitting down and not doing much because you were not in front of our screen. Most likely, most of the time, you were moving. You were craving some healthy food. Right. You were probably drinking water and feeling a lot better. Yeah. So, life isn't as complicated as we want to make it. Right. <laughs> and, right. And that is... Move, that's right? such a wonderful point there there's a finite amount of hours a day they invented an iPad they didn't invent the 30 hour day right and the fact that kids are spending nine hours at, at at home on screens and nine hours maybe eight now maybe at school right what is being lost there's a finite amount of hours consider the opportunity cost what are they not doing that they used to do and was that should and it goes back to that? Should we start the conversation? Was what we lost important, right? What did we lose, and was it important? Is it necessary? And if you look at, you know, the the quintessential scary kind of findings, you go to a restaurant and you see everybody on their phones, right? Like that's something that was lost, right? That face-to-face -face interaction. Um, you know, we have to be thoughtful and reflective about how is how is today different than then? What when we lost those nine hours? What did we lose? And, and you're right, physical activity is one of those things. And there's just warehouses of research that shows a, you know, a causation of more physical activity and better mental well-being. Yeah. Time outside, right? It's something that's natural sunlight. Those are things we lost also. Um, and the, the issue about the, you know, what are you, what are you not doing and, the, and then the sugary snacks and the being sedentary and so on. That's a, that's a whole separate issue. We've, we've focused our, our work on what's happening in the classroom, but in, in, the, in the community of people looking at this bigger issue, there are a whole bunch of things. There's the damage to the eyes, the fact that almost everybody now has some form of myopia because you know, we're always this close to a screen. There's, there's what is all of the, the Wi-Fi doing 
to there's, there's all that question. There's privacy concerns, you know, when you're, no matter what you're on, the, your data is being collected and you're being marketed at all the time. There, there are concerns from a variety of angles. We're focusing on the learning, um, but you're right, the, the physical health is a, is a massive concern as well. Yeah, the, the other thing, the sensory deprivation, I mean, they're, they're getting almost all their stimulation through their eyes and they're blocking out all of their other senses and, and it's, it has a severe effect on the brain and, and natural child development. Um, that we're, we're, we're finding out as we go along. Okay, we're getting the, uh, getting the high sign. We're, we will stay around if anybody wants to come up and, and talk or have a sign a book or something if you bought one, but we really appreciate you coming out tonight and not going to see John Grisham. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>